Welcome to the Get Real Podcast, your high octane boost of full on reality therapy for personal, business, and investing success with your host, Ron Phillips, because somebody's got to tell it like it is. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Get Real Podcast. Ron Phillips here with Heather Marchant. Got another great show today. I mean, this is going to be a good, this is going to be a really good topic today, I think, Heather. Yeah, it's been requested. I love the requested ones because I know we're, you know, hitting the mark <laughs> of what people want and need to hear. So this um, was requested by a few clients about helping to understand how, what they need to know about insurance. So we yeah, and I, you know, yes. Heather just said insurance. So like, you know, half of you checked out, but you shouldn't. This is really important. Um, you know, some you know, <laughs> insurance is a really important thing. I think we've talked about why, you know, I did have an apartment building um, burn. Uh, insurance is, is critically important. Um, and so, um, Heather, we brought somebody on who is a professional uh, to help us out That's here right. because I can only do so much. That's right. We got to have somebody I can only on tell you about apartments start. burning. I really <laughs> can't tell you much about, about what happens uh, after that with insurance. Yeah, and making sure you have adequate coverage and stuff. So we have um, one of our favorite insurance agents, Patrick Hodges, with us. Um, he's with Lipscomb and Pitts. And how long have you been with them, Patrick? Yeah, so going on 13 years, but I've actually been in the insurance business over 20. Um, wow. And I'm not that old, but it, it, my dad's actually a state farm agent. And so locally in high school and college, I actually did all their property inspections for about 14 different agencies in Memphis. So, wow. you know, got early start in high school, uh, went to the University of Memphis, uh, studied finance and risk management. I continued to work, you know, for State Farm and continued to do all their uh, property inspections. Ended up doing an internship at Lipscomb and Pitts. Um, they hired me going in, into my senior year, and that's during the 08, 09 crash. So <laughs> nobody was getting hired. If you had a, any inkling of a job, you were killing it, right? So, yeah. um, of course, I said yes. I took it, which I knew I wanted to do insurance anyway. But the brokerage world is really completely different than the, you know, state farm model, all state, you know, et cetera. So doing the internship really opened my eyes to at what we can do because now we're, we're a nationwide program, nationwide platform. Can you talk about that? What the difference is between, you know, like one of those big insurance companies that everyone sees commercials for versus what you do? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So our industry has actually done a pretty poor job of being, um, you know, I guess educational, you know, for, for our clients. And so really, I end up having to do this quite quite a bit, saying, "Look, there is a huge difference between a state farm and an all state. That's 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 not what we're doing here. So ultimately, we're a broker, and so we represent a little over 200 different insurance companies across the country. Mm -hmm. So that's that's your largest insurance companies. Um, you know, of which not every insurance company does every line of business, but there's you know specialty pockets throughout that. Um, but we actually write in all 50 states." So your standard personal lines agency, you know, is usually domiciled in, you know, Tennessee or Mississippi or California, and, and they can't do multi-state. And if they can, it's just regional, right? Uh, whereas we literally have clients in all 50 states. So, you know, there's there's no limit to what we can do. The real estate program is just, you know, honestly, one of the things that we do. And we do it really, really well. And there's only a few people in the country that, that do what we do. Um, and obviously we've worked with you guys for the last several years, it's been very successful, but, um, so yeah, so, you know, we've done everything from the NBA all-star parties, you know, we, we've insured those we've, we do manufacturing distribution, auto dealers, you know, you name it, we do it. Wow. NBA all-star party sounds a little more fun than rental properties, but that's cool. Yeah, and, and there's, yeah. and there's probably, there's probably way more, uh, exposure for the insurance companies yeah. than a uh, rental property. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that, that one was, that one was pretty difficult to do. I will say. Oh man, that's crazy. So well, when we have, um, you, we ahead, have Ron. clients, 
I've had clients for years, you know, we, we would, we would tell them, you know, Hey, here's insurance you go get. And then, well, you, why can't I just use my normal insurance? And I'm like, well, you can call your normal insurance for sure. Get a, get a quote nine times out of 10, they call me back and go, Oh yeah, well, they can't do that. And I, and I'm, yeah, I, I knew that already <laughs> that they couldn't do it, but you know, occasionally they can, but very rarely can they do it. Um, because it's such a specialized product, uh, Patrick. And, and again, you have that whole regional national thing that, that most people don't even understand. And why would they, right? I mean, if you don't own a bunch of properties outside of the state where you live, why would you know that? Nope. You know? Yeah, that's true. That's right. So how well, did you, and, how and did you guys lot. first meet? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Patrick. Well, I, you know, I'm just going to say, you know, truly the, um, Part of his personal lines agencies are just so limited again on, on what they can do. And what I mean by that is once it, once a property becomes owned in an entity, so that's where a lot of people get confused. You know, if you buy it mm -hmm. as Ron Phillips individual, you can go to personal lines policy all day long. But once you turn it into Ron Phillips LLC, then mm -hmm. that knocks out, you know, most all traditional personal lines companies. And at that point, it becomes a commercial policy, in which case it needs a true commercial policy on, on, on what we do or a master program. So that's, that's where I think a lot of people get tripped up is, hey, I've got, you know, three different entities. I'm buying all these properties. I'm just calling my state farm guy. But they're limited on what they can do, right? So huh. um, give you a little idea of how it works with us. So. Um, what we do is we underwrite the potential of what the entire portfolio could look like, right? So uh, for you guys and the volume that you guys do, we underwrite the entire portfolio and give all those investors rates as if they own several hundred, several thousand properties on their own. So that's the big key difference is, you know, when they go to State Farm, you know, they have one property, right? And they may pay 800 bucks for that one property, but there's, there's no volume behind it. Right. Mm -hmm. So when we're pumping thousands and thousands of dollars through a program to an insurance company, they're, they're giving us much more favorable rates and much more favorable coverage than what any investor can get on their own. Mm -hmm. So ultimately that's what I tell people is that when you're jumping onto these, you know, and you've got to be careful with master programs, but um, the way we've got ours set up is, you know, we, we don't play any games. We like to make sure things are done correctly and done the right way. Um, you know, so you just got to be a little bit careful with, you know, some of the programs that are out there because there's a lot of people that don't know what they're doing and they get into some trouble. Gotcha. Yeah. We've, okay. and, and, you know, we tell our clients that all the time, right? There's, there's a power in numbers, um, you know, whether people like it or not, those who have more get a better deal. I mean, that's just the way the world works. Mm -hmm. uh, well, at least um, the way America works. And, um, <laughs> you know, because of that, because of the buying power that we all collectively have, we're able to do this um, really unique program with you uh, and your company, Patrick. And it's, it's, it has been incredible um, for, for our folks. I mean, it's just, it's been incredible. Well, <clears throat> Absolutely. And, and it's, it's not just a pricing standpoint. I mean, from the from a coverage perspective, mm -hmm. these investors cannot go out and get the coverage that we offer through the program on their own. Unless they have a huge portfolio of properties, they can't just go down the street and put a program like this together. Yep. It, you know, and then let's shift over into claims because obviously if you buy insurance, you hope your claims get paid. Right. So that's, yep. that's the, that's the name of the game. Well, so let me go back to my state farm example. If you have one property and you're paying $800 to insure a hundred thousand dollar house, it burns to the ground. What do you think is going to happen? They're probably going to cancel you or, you know, your rates going to go through the roof. Your yep. deductible is going to go through the roof. Uh, whereas if you're participating on a master program like what we have, we can take a lot of hits before we ever talk about increasing deductibles or increasing rates. So really from a loss ratio perspective for an individual investor, it's actually a good insulator from claims. So a lot of people say, well, I don't want to be with a bunch of other people. Well, 
yes and no. I mean, that's ultimately what the insurance industry does anyway, right? So we're just yeah. doing it on a smaller scale, but on a larger scale from what they can do on their own. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you quote these with a cost per square foot? Because I get a lot of questions about that. Yeah, that's a great question. And I've actually been on the phone a lot today alone, uh, talking about some changes that are coming. Um, you know, I don't know how much you guys know about what's going on in the market this year, but uh, 2020 was relatively quiet. 21 has been insane. And the what I mean by that is everyone is pushing valuations, which means, you know, valuations are going up, rates are going up. And ultimately, because costs are going up across the country for a carton of eggs or a roof. So, you know, all, all that all that goes up accordingly. And, you know, really, the other issue that we're, we're dealing with, and we started seeing a little bit of it in, in 2020 and towards the end of 2019, is the catch up from all the claims that have happened over the last several years in the industry. OK, so we've got fires, windstorms tornadoes, hurricanes, flooding, riots, all the looting, all that type of stuff caused billions and billions of dollars for the insurance company or insurance industry. And because of that, we're just seeing a trickle down effect of, of rate. So just, you know, it, it, that's all been coming because of what's happened in the past. But, you know, unfortunately now it just looks like we're just following suit with everything else in the world that's going up. And yeah. that's not quite, yep. quite the case. Um, but going back to the valuation, so again, everything's going up. And so really the way we have it set up now is we allow flexibility on the valuations for your investors. Okay. So what we do is we set a minimum threshold of cost per square foot of $80 for replacement costs. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we can go up from there. So, you, you know, there's all types of different investment strategies. Some people like to come in and say, I'll self-insure, but I want to, you know, cover $40 a square foot myself. Well, we don't do that here. So again, we, we do a $80 per square foot. That's your baseline. If you want to go above that, great. If you want to go below it, we cannot do that. Um, and so there's, there's several reasons for that. And I'm not sure I'll bore you with all the details of that, <laughs> but ultimately it's from a, a co-insurance and, and coverage issue at claims time that people don't realize that they can get themselves into if they under-report the value of the property. So we just tend to, again, do things the right way, you know, and, and set a minimum threshold so we don't have any question at claims time as to how much money is getting paid. Um, but again, you know, since things are going up, you know, there's a lot of talk. I mean, $80 is the minimum. There's a lot of talk in pushing 100, 110, mm -hmm. you know, depending on where it is in the country um, for, for investment properties. So which is really crazy because just a few years ago, I mean, we, you know, we'll we were working with sixty to $65 a square foot pretty regularly. Yeah. And, you know, now it's $80 is pretty much the minimum. So, um, you know, it's, it's just each, all these carriers are just getting a lot more restrictive uh, on what they're doing. And not only that, but there's a lot of carriers that are actually pulling out of the marketplace right now because of how poor these claims have been over the last few years. So they're losing mm -hmm. their shirt. So rates have to go up. And values have to go up to keep it, keep in line with inflation. So it's just um, kind of a perfect storm. Yeah. I mean, it's good that the cost is already so low on the policy, though, because upping it a few dollars per square foot or even $20 per square, per square foot, I've run the calculations um, using, you know, the calculations you gave us, and it's still really affordable. So, yeah, it's still, oh, so it's the, still leaked the net better than they do. Yeah. Yeah, still leagues better than anybody can get on their own. Uh, and, you know, I agree. I mean, Heather and I are building right now. Um, mm -hmm. I would I would love to build for what it was two years ago. <laughs> I, I, mean, I, would, I would love to, sure. but I, I can't. <laughs> um, and you probably get some questions, too, when you're talking about price per square foot. Um, you know, the difference between the Memphis market where, where you are and where I own a lot of properties and California yeah. Is I mean they're they're not even on the same planet as far as uh, price per square foot to build. Um, yeah. Same house, take the exact same house, and you stick it in California. Um, I mean, one hundred ten dollars a foot. People will, will laugh at you. I mean, there's you you can't do anything um, for one hundred ten dollars right. a foot in California. 
And the other thing I um, remind clients of too, because they'll look at it and see such a big difference between their purchase price and the insured value. And I remind them, look, the land is still there and the land's worth something, usually roughly 20% of the purchase price. So you have to take that out. Um, the lenders okay. do require that we have the insurance high enough to cover the loan amount, which is just fine. So sometimes we have to adjust with your team to make sure that yeah, it meets theirs. <clears throat> that's right, that's right. So I'm glad you brought that up because even though we start at $80 a foot, it's quite possible that's the initial quote that comes out. <laughs> And your investor may look at it and go, that's fantastic. Let's roll with it. They send it over to the closing team. And the closing team goes, whoa, 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 we need $120 a foot. Well, at the last second, you know, we have to bump up the values, which ultimately changes the total premium. But we get a lot of those calls, but this is not a bait and switch. The net rate never changed. Mm -hmm. the, the strong net rate was, was consistent. It was just purely a valuation issue, which is why the, the rate went up. Yep, exactly. So, yeah, that's that's something we can um, tackle ahead of time, maybe a little better too. Um, as far as the setting up of the policy and long term, I know it was set up um, initially with a big purchase of properties. Long term, is there ever a cap at how many properties can go into one of these master policies? No, no. Amazing. Really, the the more the better, because at the end of the day, the more properties that you have ultimately the better the loss ratio will be because we'll have more premium to take on those losses. That's so, so that's, cool. yeah, there, there are some smaller programs out there that are limited. The one that you guys have and, and typically the ones that we work with that we build um, typically don't have a cap. So, I mean, we could, you know, it's, it's infinite, the possibilities. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool though. Um, if clients want to add on, uh, I know your liability protection is better than the insurance companies we recommended before we met you, Patrick. So is there the liability, can you explain, actually explain the current liability coverage within the policy first, and then I'll ask my follow-up question. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So um, to piggyback off what you just said, the uh, most of your standard, and I'm going to pick on State Farm because I'm most familiar with that and it's the family thing, <laughs> so I can do that. But um, <laughs> traditionally with rental properties, they're going to give you somewhere between three and 500000 on the liability side. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's their starting point. And at that point, you have to build up, you know, extra layers of coverage by an umbrella. So that's why you, you hear a lot of people asking for an umbrella because they just assume that the, the you know, the base uh, level of coverage is lower than what it needs to be. So what we did, we just start at obviously almost double or triple on what what most people are able to get on their own, which is a million dollars per occurrence with a two million aggregate. And what that means is you essentially can have two one million dollar claims on your property on any given year. Hmm. Okay, um, and so that's ultimately for bodily injury and property damage that you guys are legally responsible for. So the, you know, the slip and falls on the property, the roof caved in and, you know, killed my cat and you get sued, you know, so there's, there's, we have seen so many different claim scenarios. It's unbelievable, but um, shockingly, most claims have really not gotten out of control. The ones that, the only ones that have ever been questionable are the ones that involve a fatality. Yep. That that's where you know that's where you can really start seeing the the, the verdicts creep up, uh, which you you know you want those higher limits. So which is why you know our baseline of coverage is just a million per occurrence and a two million, million aggregate. And so for your investors that need additional limits beyond that, providing you have multiple multiple properties, you know we can look at other umbrella options um, on a case by case basis. Okay, just cool. so we're clear, uh, Patrick, like if, if I have uh, Ron Phillips LLC and then I've got, you know, RP LLC over here, completely different entities, one entity owns one property, one entity owns the other property, I have a claim, that million dollar aggregate is, is protecting Ron Phillips. It, it has nothing to do with, with RP LLC over here because it's a completely different entity, correct? Correct. Yeah, it's a it's a per location aggregate limit. Okay, so you are not sharing limits with any of your other properties. So if you have five properties, you have five separate standard um, aggregate limits. 
okay, cool. which is also different than what you traditionally see uh, with some of the standard standard markets that are direct riders. Um, a lot of times they'll do the three to five hundred thousand, and then give you a million dollar umbrella that covers six different properties. And then you share what people don't understand is you share that limit across the whole group. All of the properties. Typically not a per location aggregate. And I think that's the other thing too, that when people are asking for an umbrella, they're, they're usually looking for a million dollar umbrella. That's, that's typically where they're, that's the number that they're looking for. It's, it's, I've, I've rarely seen people ask for anything more than a million dollar umbrella. And I, I find it interesting where people, um, people don't understand what you just said. There's, there's literally more insurance on one property than there is with the umbrella uh, over oh, covering the three or five or however many properties it is mm-hmm. with their umbrella policy. Um, exactly. Huh. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, and, and one question. I'm oh, 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 sorry about that. I was just going to say it does no. take a conversation sometimes on a, you know, investor, uh, individual investor basis to just, you know, educate them. Mm-hmm. And we're happy to do that. Um, you know, our, our team fields calls all day long, every day from investors all over the world, uh, answering questions like that. So, you know, we, we do get people to call in, ask about umbrellas and we just explain the process. And like I said, nine times out of 10, they're like, well, if you're giving me a million per occurrence and a 2 million aggregate, then why do I want to pay more money for additional coverage? So, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, one question I get asked often is, is it necessary to add a property manager as additional insured? Because a lot of the property management management agreements require it. So if like a tenant slips and falls, right, is it typical that they're going to be suing both the property manager and the owner? And is that, does that add any complexity? Well, you know, like you said, most of the contracts require it. So it's not like they have a choice. I mean, if you want to work with ABC property management group, you've got to have them as additional insured. And at the end of the day, what people are doing is just looking to limit their liability. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're, they're shifting that liability off to the landlord and the owner, you know, as much as they can. I mean, just like, you know, any other company would for any of their vendors or anybody else that they work with. Mm -hmm. So that's all that is. And when you do that, and you do add someone as additional insured, but that simply means that you are sharing your limit of coverage with that particular person or entity. Hmm. So, you know, yes, if they get sued, they're going to notify their own insurance company, the management company will, but, but also better believe that their insurance company will be looking to the other policy to help pay, you hmm. know, uh, certain, certain portions of the claim potentially. Okay. That's really interesting. depends on the claim. It, it, it depends if it's truly yeah. has anything to do with our client, you know, who, who owns the property or was this a pure management mistake? You know, because a lot of times we'll turn it into both companies and the adjusters will fight it out and the adjusters mm-hmm. will look at it and say, no, we're not responsible. That This is completely a management company uh, issue. Interesting. Okay. Um, and then renewals. I get this question a lot too. So our clients purchase a property, it gets sold on the secondary market. So there's another, you know, company that reaches out and now holds that mortgage. So what is the most efficient way of making sure that your team is updated for the following year to make sure it's renewed properly? Yeah, great question, because this does come up a lot. And the reality is, if no one tells us, then we have no clue anything changed, right? Mm -hmm. So that is a constant, you know, issue that we see is that the, you know, when, when the loan is sold, we don't get any type of notification. So, you know, it's, I would just say for the investors, if they know that that happens and they get a new mortgage statement, then they need to make sure that they reach out to us, whatever it is, what, you know, depending on, you know, when the renewal is, but just, just any time throughout the year and just let us know, Hey, please update one, two, three main street. Here's the new, you know, mortgagee and we'll update it. And the system takes a few minutes and we're done. But Do you what, typically- what ends up oh, bogging. Sorry. Go. <laughs> I just say what ends up bogging the system down is just when, you know, the, the new mortgage company is screaming at the investor and the investor's mad that we didn't do anything. And we're going, we didn't even know anything happened, <laughs> you know? So uh, once we find out, we jump all over it. We take care of it. 
but 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 ultimately, yeah, we just I would say if the investors could reach out to us and let us know of any changes, then that would be great. Do you need a loan number or just the lien hold, like the name of the lien holder? What do you need? Yeah, uh, loan number and really the, so every lender's got a bunch of different um, addresses. Mm. And here's another another thing that comes up. So we want the address to the the insurance department at the bank. Okay. okay. And, and reason, reason being is, uh, you know, what ends up happening is these, these insurance or the, uh, the, the mortgage companies, when the insurance companies send out all these documents, they get routed sometimes mm -hmm. to the wrong addresses. So when they're, when you go to close on a property, there may, there might be the initial first address, uh, for that particular mortgage company that handled the insurance, but then somewhere mid year, even if, if it's with the same mortgage company, they change the address to a different PO box. And so, whereas we've been sending it to that direct, you know, the original yeah. one. And then like I said, three months down the road, we find out that, Hey, you know, nothing had, has gotten paid. And the reason why is because the, the address is incorrect. So yeah, the, the loan number, we need to make sure the address is correct. So any changes that happen, just let us know throughout the year. We're happy to help. Okay. Very cool. Um, so our when our clients reach out with that, is there a way that they can get that address? Is it on their statement usually? Is there a way for them to find it? Um, every lender is different. So, okay. you know. So reaching it, out to it, them. It's, Really, usually on their website or something like that, okay. but a lot of times it will be on their statement. So, okay. um, you know, a lot of the statements will show it. So, but it okay. just, it completely depends on the lender and, you know, it's, um, I'm not going to say anything bad about lenders, but you know, <laughs> it, we do have issues with, with them. I will. Time to time. I'll just say it for you because yeah. we have had uh, a couple of podcast episodes about this. Um, because I had it, I had an in, I had a a servicer that didn't pay my insurance, yeah. right? The whole reason you have a servicer is so that they pay the insurance because yeah. boneheads like me won't do it, and the servicer yeah. didn't do it, right? So this is really important. I don't want to just gloss over this. This is really really important um, because when the fire happens is when they don't pay the insurance. That that's how it always works, right? So. Murphy's law says the place is going to burn while Ron doesn't have insurance because the servicer didn't pay the insurance bill. That that's, that's how that goes down. Um, so uh, that kind of leads us into claims, right? We, which we talked about up front, walk us through the claims process here. Is it, is this something that's um, that's easy with these master insurance policies or is this something that's, that's complicated and convoluted because there's so many people involved? How, how's it work? Yeah, so um, I'll break it down several different ways. So um, I guess let me back up a little bit. But, you know, Lipscomb and Pitts, we've got 140 local employees here. Um, and then we've also got an in-house claims department with a claims attorney on staff that's available for our clients, you know, depending on the complexity of the claim. You know, not just your run of the mill, but, you know, we've got three different uh, essentially claims adjusters on staff. And then, again, the, the, the claims uh, attorney. It's able to look through that, but um, back in uh, the end of November of, of 2020, Lipscomb and Pitts merged with a group out of Fort Worth, Texas called Higginbotham, and together we are about the 15th largest privately held brokerage group in the country. And so ultimately what that means is, you know, instead of one claims attorney, we now have access to several. Instead of three claims adjusters, we now have access to 25. So, you know, just the resources have been exponentially greater by merging. Um, now, just your run-of-the-mill claim, what ends up happening is your investor will reach out typically to my team. We will bring in the claims team internally, okay? So one of our claims people will reach out to the investor take a statement if there's not any detail in the email, because a lot of times we just get an email that says, Hey, I had a claim, call me. So we'll, we'll reach out. The claims team will call, get the report. We file that with the insurance company. And typically within 48 hours, they assign an adjuster. 
and it will be a local adjuster depending on you know you know where it is in the country. Um, so it won't be a Lipscomb and Pitts adjuster. It will be an adjuster from whatever company, um, you know, based on whatever state or city that that particular property is in. Okay. Yeah, that's super helpful. Good point to bring up. So, well, that's yeah. those are all my questions that I had from clients that I've been keeping for this conversation. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, I, I tell you, uh, insurance is, um, I, I understand more now than ever how critical insurance is. And not only that, but to understand to understand the thing you were talking about, right? The intricacies of each one of the policies. It's not, it, it's not enough to just go and, um, you know, grab a policy from your, your cousin who started up in the insurance business um, on a property that's out of state um, that, that, you, that, you, that you don't see. You need to understand. Um, and I'll give one more example. We, we bought an apartment complex and we had a claim right before we closed, which is makes things oh. intensely more uh, complicated because this the this, this the seller's policy, but we're the guys who are supposed to get the money because we're buying the it was, that that's a big convoluted mess in and of itself. But the seller of the property didn't realize that the reason he had good insurance rates is because he had a uh, he had a twenty thousand dollar deductible not on the whole thing, which is what he thought, but per building because wow. there were five buildings, right? So this insurance claim <clears throat> that would have been, you know, mostly covered ended up not being mostly covered. It'd be mostly covered by him instead. Huge cash outlay because he didn't understand what was in the policy. The $20,000 deductible on a, you know, three, $4 million apartment building doesn't seem like that big of a deal until you have a, a wind in, a wind occurrence happen to a roof Oof. on five buildings where you, <laughs> if you have to replace five, five roofs, you're, you know, a little over a hundred thousand dollars just in roofing, right. but you've got five buildings with $20,000. That's a hundred thousand dollar deductible, which means your insurance basically paid you jack. Right. Uh, I've never even heard of such a thing, Patrick. I'm this pretty sophisticated guy. I think it's really important that that people understand that um, a understand the insurance, kind of like we talked about today. But b understand that we we put something together here that kind of takes care of all of that stuff, right? We've we've increased the limits, not decreased the limits. There's there's more insurance here than than they would normally get anywhere else. It's just for less money because we have the power of, um, of group buying, and um, and man, that's been it's so cool Amazing. to have. Amazing. Well, and and let me draw a line in the sand too, um, based on what our master program does for you know the majority of RP Capital clients, and then you know the apartment world. So, our program is for basically it's automatic coverage for one to four family dwellings. Okay, so anywhere in the country. Uh, the rates are very similar, with the exception of coastal coastal properties. Obviously, carry a different rate. But um, point being, though, back to your story about the apartment, the apartment world is a completely different animal. And so, a lot of people try to treat that world very similarly to how they would invest in a rental dwelling. Uh, and, and you can't do that, you know, on the financial side. And you can't do that on the insurance side either. So, it's a uh, it's a um, that's where a lot of people, a lot of investors do get into trouble is that story. Just for, just like what you just said is they do not realize how many different types of policies are out there for apartment communities. Uh, and we do a ton of tons of apartments all over the country, but you know, the, the market for habitational properties, specifically apartments the last year has really tightened up. Rates are really on the rise. And, you know, to your point about the deductibles, yes. I mean, that's becoming more and more commonplace to do either per building deductible or percentage deductibles. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of gotten crazy depending on, you know, where you are in the country. Yep. Um, but just make sure if you're an investor, you know, and you do choose to invest in apartments, just make sure you completely understand the coverage forms. Um, and, you know, just because something is, 
you get what you pay for, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of times people just go after cheap. And then you don't find out what cheap actually bought you until claim happens. <laughs> yeah, that's so yeah. True. Until you're until you're paying a hundred thousand dollars of a hundred thirty thousand dollar claim. Yeah, yep. <laughs> that's right. Brutal, right. man. This has been super well, man, I, I Yeah, I really appreciate it, and I appreciate the fact that that we were able to um, connect, put this thing together, um, and I know I know our clients are too probably more so now that they've actually been able to hear what this thing really is. I think it's this, uh, it's this weird phantom thing that they've never heard of. Um, and they can't believe that it's as inexpensive as it is. Um, and I think now, uh, they'll have a little bit better understanding and appreciation for just what it is and how powerful it is. Patrick, appreciate you coming on and, and explaining it to us. Absolutely. At any time, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. All right, everybody out there, um, insurance is critical. Um, you should know that now listening to me, you should understand. Um, and just like every week, um, this week, no different. Get out there and make something happen. Now, let's make it big this week, folks. No kidding. Yeah. Don't, 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 be, don't, be, yeah, don't <laughs> be out there just, you know, dinking around. Let's go make something big happen this week. <laughs> Till next time, guys. Bye, everyone. This has been the Get Real Podcast. To subscribe and for more information, including a list of all episodes, go to getrealestatesuccess.com.